abundantly out its contributions. Okay, thank you very much. Carlo, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I like to thank uh, uh, Pascal and uh, his team for keeping us active during this pandemic time and also the whole show going <clears throat> in a very nice way uh, so that we could uh, be in touch for long. And uh, also thanks for inviting me to give this uh, talk here today. So this is uh, honor for me. And thanks Pankat, uh, Sampath for your kind introduction and kind words. So um, uh, good day to you all. So today I'll be trying to, <clears throat> uh, uh, since uh, uh, give a brief uh, overview about the subject first, and then uh, I go to the topic that I would like to talk on, that is selective excitation of electrons in iron-based systems using time intervals. <clears throat> so before I go to the topic, I would like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators. So. Uh, this work, the experiment was, uh, whatever I'll be going to pre presenting today, is done uh, essentially uh, in a uh, time resolved laboratory in Slovenia at Nova Gorica, in University of Nova Gorica. So this is called CTS or Nino Lab. So, uh, and the whole work is done primarily by one of my students who actually worked there as a postdoc. So he's a very bright student. Dr. Ganesh Odhikari, and there are many other collaborators who actually contributed significantly. <clears throat> All the materials that uh, we have studied are uh, prepared by one of my colleagues, um, a bright uh, crystallograph crystallographer and a good physicist. So <clears throat> the financial support is by various agencies and uh, the work has been published in PRB and there is another one which is under uh, publication. So, as you know that whenever we talk about complexity in classical material, I was just tempted, uh, uh, it was tempting to show this figure which often we observe, which is a phase diagram of water. So, although we often refer water as a simple system, like there are proverbs that uh, something, when it is simple, we call it simple like water, but it's probably one of the most complex uh, system, which uh, there are a lot of uh, unusual puzzles which are thrown uh, up and not really understood well. So <clears throat> you can see that in this phase diagram, there are um, uh, two red points. One is called triple. This is taken from the website. So uh, this is triple point and uh, where you have all the three phases coexist and there is a critical point. So beyond this point, of course, we all know that uh, you cannot really liquefy gas uh, by just simply apply applying pressure. So um, the system goes into a kind of a state which is very, very, uh, I mean, exotic, you can say, where different things coexist together. And most of the exoticities that we observe in various um, materials somehow are linked to this criticality. So which I'll show you some of the examples. <clears throat> For example, one of the most interesting material that um, we are we know in the correlated electron systems, which is cerium copper to silicon two, which is one of the first heavy fermion superconductor has been discovered. <clears throat> so here, you know that the cerium moment is more like an atomic moment and uh, the magnetism is primarily driven by the interaction of cerium moment, uh, which can be mediated by conduction electrons uh, or, uh, I mean, there are various other exotic things happens. So if you are at a low pressure resign, then what happens is that the behavior uh, of this material is more like local moment kind of behavior. You get antiferromagnetic ordering and when you increase pressure, gradually <clears throat> there is a stronger hybridization of the cerium 4 f with the conduction electrons. And you do see some kind of a phenomena which is well known as Kondo kind of effect, 
where of course the conduction electron tries to screen the local moment and if you are at a sufficiently low temperature then you do see a non magnetic kind of behavior of these materials and uh, <clears throat> these two phases where you have anti ferromagnetic ordering and you have this condo kind of scenario where uh, the forep moment is coupled with the conduction electrons they are separated by this phase line and if you go to sufficiently low temperature you can actually go to this critical point beyond which this two scenario is active now we can see that there is another line which actually defines the superconductivity <clears throat> so if you are uh, really below this temperature then you can uh, get superconductivity so often we see this superconducting dome actually is coming around this critical point that we often refer because of certain interactions that separates two exotic phases now in this material there is another thing which happens is that if you go to a very high pressure <clears throat> then uh, the cerium forep hybridizes much more strongly with the conduction electrons and at some point the cerium forep doesn't really remain like a local moment and it behaves like a, a extended state or energy bands and there is a volume collapse so of course the crystal structure is protected but there is a sudden change in volume which is called volume collapse and um, uh, these two phases are separated by this vast green line and you can also get superconductivity around this critical point which happens at a different side okay so this one is the intermediate valence state which is pretty well known uh, for many many years that you can see that is 2003 <coughs> it was published there are many other systems so let me give another example which where you do see this kind of superconductivity and um, in a heavy fermion kind of system which is based on cerium so this is 115 which is probably one of the most studied kind of cerium based superconductors so cerium cobalt indium 5 as you know that is probably the highest tc which is close to 2 kelvin or so <clears throat> here one interesting thing happens so um, here you can see that if you are at a low pressure regime you do have this anti ferromagnetic ordering where the local moment kind of picture is active now if you increase the pressure this local moment hybridizes with the conduction electrons and do see condo kind of uh, scenario which is separated by this phase boundary and if you go to a sufficiently low temperature you can get the superconducting dome okay, the crystal structure is like this i'm not going into the details of this but one interesting thing here is that you have a coexisting kind of regime where you have anti ferromagnetic ordering and superconductivity this is very unusual because as you know that this is a very well known this one is also uh, downloaded from uh, the website just for the simplicity to uh, show this here demonstrate here which can be done by any of the lab <clears throat> i think uh, sorry so so here you can see that um, uh, superconductors they don't really like magnetism here is a simple example where you have a superconductor and there is a magnet which in normal case you can actually keep it here on that there is no issue now if you put liquid nitrogen it goes to the superconducting phase and then you can see that it starts levitating because the material has become perfect diamond so this one is pretty well known which is known as meissner effect so anything you do i mean um, this really stays like that so how a material of this kind where you have anti ferromagnetism and superconductivity actually coexisting this is a very surprising so there are many other materials i'll show you another uh, some more example where this kind of things happens so um, the other complex material where we have seen this kind of phase boundary is cuprate superconductor which probably is one of the most studied unconventional superconductors <clears throat> so here also you can see that the superconducting dome looks almost similar like as shown in the previous cases the only difference is that of course here the temperature is very very high <clears throat> so this is one of the high temperature where the tc can be close to or more than 90 kelvin or so so these materials have of course their own complexity because if you are in the uh, normal phase where there is no superconductivity 
you get a pseudo gap kind of phase, which has been studied extensively and really not understood well. Then if you are on the other side, which is a heavy doped side, there the behavior is more like a Fermi liquid, but these two are separated by a phase, which is called strange metallic phase, which is not really Fermi liquid, uh, but there is no pseudo gap in this case. <coughs> so if we look at the phase boundary that I have been talking about, uh, so there are different proposals which are there. So one, you can see that people think that probably uh, there is a phase line which is separating this order where you have pseudo gap phase and then this strange metallic phase. They are separated by this line and it continues all through this uh, line where you have superconductivity and of course there is a quantum critical point. And this is one of the prediction and of, similarly there is a, a phase boundary which separates this Fermi liquid and quantum critical point which is another line like this. So there are many other issues which are there. I'm not going into the details of that. Uh, just give um, examples where how the complexity in a material comes out where there are exoticities involved. Okay? Similarly, you can have uh, say organic superconductors. <clears throat> this is somewhat different from the previous cases where we have shown. So in all the previous cases, you have electron correlation very, very strong and the ground state is a magnetically ordered state. But in this material, you don't have magnetic order. There is a spin liquid kind of phase there. And this spin liquid phase is separated by a phase boundary. And um, so if you go from this left side to the high pressure regime, you can get a Fermi liquid metal. And if you are at a sufficiently low temperature, you can actually achieve superconductivity. The most recent um, thrust area in this field is iron-based superconductors, which has been studied extensively. And today I will be actually talking about these systems primarily uh, for our studies. So here you can see that the structure of this iron-based systems is basically like this. So here you have this barium, or you can have any other rare earths or any other strontium, calcium, so alkali or alkaline earth materials. So they are actually coming like um, uh, this, this layer. Okay. So this layer and this iron and arsenic, they actually form a effectively two dimensional kind of layer. So one of the most in interesting thing in this material is that most of these high TC superconductors that the, electro, the crystal structure also is effectively two-dimensional. So that is very, uh, so this probably it says that this kind of superconductivity probably requires such kind of a two-dimensionality. Of course, one could ask more questions on that, but let me point out the unusual behavior that we see in these materials. <clears throat> Here, you can see that you have this iron arsenic layer, which is basically responsible for electronic conduction in this and all the exotic properties or anything that we observe, they are happening because of the electron dynamics in these kind of layers and they are separated by some, uh, some uh, other kind of elements which could be alkaline earth or rare earth or any other material. Okay? So they can be like a charged reservoir layer and so on, which is also observed in cuprates. So here you can see that if you change the doping level, <coughs> At low doping level, they are metallic, which is slightly different from the cuprate systems, which are antiferromagnetic insulators. So here you have a metallic system and they show antiferromagnetic ordering, or you can say spin density wave kind of state set seen in these materials. And if you are at a high pressure region, then you go to a structure which is called tetragonal. Normally at room temperature, this tetragonal structure is very, very stable. <clears throat> so tetragonal structure means that your lattice constant A and B, they are equal, but the C is different. So it's much longer compared to the A and B, okay? So if you are at a particular pressure and cool down, it goes from tetragonal to orthorhombic phase. And this transition temperature can be tuned by doping or application of pressure and so on. So I'll show you some more example on application of pressure. So this TS actually tells you that the structural transition temperature and TN tells you the antiferromagnetic ordering temperature. So now if you are at a certain doping level, 
you see a similar kind of dome representing the superconducting phase appears, which we have seen in the previous cases also. The interesting thing is that here you have a region where as if some magnetic ordering also coexists with superconductivity. So this is very, very unusual. And again, it goes against the intuitive kind of scenario that we often observe that is called Meissner effect. So, so it's, it's actually throws in lots of puzzle to this kind of problem that we have been looking at. Okay. So uh, there is another material which I want to show, which we have been, um, uh, I'll be showing some result on this. <clears throat> so this is europium iron to arsenic to here. The structure is essentially same, but instead of barium, these uh, pink balls are essentially europium. So the additional interaction which happens is that this europium, this is a rare earth, it has some magnetic moment. And this also orders antiferromagnetically in addition to the magnetic order that you have for this iron arsenic layers. So look at the phase diagram here. So if you apply pressure, you can see that at room temperature, it's tetragonal. And if you cool down, of course, it goes to the orthoromic antiferromagnetic phase and this transition temperature reduces gradually if you apply pressure. And at certain pressure, suddenly you can see that this structural transition doesn't survive. So as if that this tetragonal phase actually goes down. So you have this uh, A equal to B kind of scenario. So that which is a fourfold rotational symmetry, which survives within this. The most interesting thing is that here in this region, you do get superconductivity. And in this superconducting phase, the antiferromagnetic ordering due to this europium moment survives. So this is a system where again, you see the superconductivity and magnetism actually coexist together, which is very, very unusual. So here, one thing we could ask, is this suppression of T0 is really important because you have seen that somehow this um, uh, high temperature superconductivity or unconventional superconductivity somehow likes to have the layered structure. And it appears that probably this C4 symmetry um, is favored because most of them have that kind of symmetry. Of course, you can have other hidden order which gives you a lower dimensional, uh, lower dimensionality of the system. But often we do see that this fourfold symmetry is important. Okay? The other observation that people have found is that if you apply a pressure which is non-hydrostatic, then this superconductivity is not favored in this system. But if you look at say calcium iron to arsenic 2, which is almost identical, and you just replaced europium by calcium, we do see that this is a paper published in 2009 <clears throat> in PRB, which shows that uh, you have this tetragonal to orthoromic transition. And then in between, there is another phase where you have this uh, two phase coexist orthorhombic, and there is something called collapse tetragonal phase. I'm not going into the details of that because it's not necessary for today's talk. What I want to say is that you have the structural transition. And if you like to go to this phase somehow, this tetragonal symmetry actually is favored. And they do see superconductivity in these materials. <laughs> Now, there are another experiment which was done subsequently, and they felt that probably the pressure medium that has been used, that gets frozen much before you really reach the superconducting transition, which might give you non-hydrostaticity. So uh, let's use a pressure medium which, which remains actually in the um, phase, which can transmit hydrostatic pressure. So people use helium for the pressure medium and they did not find superconductivity in this. So it looks like this is a system where a non-hydrostatic probably is favoring superconductivity in this. We don't really know what exactly is happening, but it shows how complex these materials are. The other aspect that people often have been talking about is called pneumaticity. So this is basically linked to the structural transition. So at room temperature, you have this tetragonal structure where A equal to B, now, if you go to orthorhombic structure, this A is no longer equal to B. So you as if have introduced effective low dimensionality in the system. So you have this antiferromagnetic order, which orders one way in one direction and another way in another direction and so on. So there are a lot of complexity and there are a lot of discussions in 
on pneumaticity is there. <clears throat> and people uh, believe that probably this transition where you have the C4 to C2 symmetry transition, which leads to pneumaticity. So most of the material that shows superconductivity probably are close to or in proximity to such kind of phase transition. So this pneumatic fluctuation probably is important. So what I tried to say so far is that that uh, probably all these examples shows that we are reasonably confused and the complexity of the material is quite clear. So uh, let's see what exactly is happening microscopically. So these are all the properties that we observe. So we know that superconductivity involves coupling of electrons. So if an electron moves in a lattice, which is the electrical transport, since electron has a negative charge, it could polarize or pull positively charged sides towards itself, which can create a charge density imbalance of the positive charge, which can be viewed by second electron. And since there is a positive charge density change or increase compared to the other area, so this can feel an attractive force, which is essentially the Cooper pair. And it's called electron phonon coupling mediated Cooper pair. So here, phonon acts as a group. And of course, the BCS theory is based on such kind of Cooper pairs. And we know that the moment you have two electrons, they form this Cooper pair mediated by phonon, they can actually move very smoothly in the lattice without much of a scattering. And that gives rise to superconductivity. Okay? In this regard, the high temperature superconductors, of course, are thought to be somewhat different. I just want to mention here one comment by uh, Anderson. <clears throat> so is there glue in q plate superconductors? So he said that many theories on electron pairing in cuprate superconductor maybe is in the wrong track. So the main thing, the main interactions that happens in these materials are electron-electron Coulomb repulsion, which is represented by U. So this U is very, very strong. So that doesn't allow two electrons to come close to each other. There is another interaction energy, which is called J. So if you have two anti-parallel electrons, they actually feel somewhat attractive kind of force which allows them to come to close to each other. So both these interaction terms, their energy scale is very, very large, so which is of the order of electron volt. So do we really need something uh, like phonon that would couple these two electrons together that gives rise to the pair? So he said that this cartoon is there in his article. We have a mammoth and an elephant in our refrigerator. Do we really care much if there is also a mouse? So there are different kinds of philosophy uh, about the microscopic behavior of these systems up there. So now let's really summarize what I'm trying to say. Blue is of course an unresolved issue. We don't really know how the two electrons are really paired together, but the problem is much more complex. How the magnetic order coexists with superconducting phase. Okay? So is it really linked to superconductivity? All we know in most of the materials that uh, particularly the unconventional one where electron phonon coupling or the BCS theory is not really applicable. So we know that if you suppress magnetic order, you can actually get superconductivity. But there are some systems that show that both the things um, coexist. So let's look at the problem a little bit much more criti uh, critically and see what is happening. So I would take example of iron based systems. So now I'm going into the topic with some specific things. So please uh, ask me if there is an issue which uh, is not clear. <clears throat> I'll be happy to really talk about it. So let's look at a material which is calcium iron to arsenic. So this is the band structure which comes from ab initio or BFP type of calculations. So there are many lines which are there. We don't really need to worry about this spaghetti all, all through. So what would like to say to focus on this area, okay? So this zero is the Fermi level. So any electron whose energy is close to this Fermi level is essentially responsible for all material property. Because you know that the temperature scale gives you a order of a millivolt. So like 300 Kelvin is 25 millivolt or so. So all the electrons which take part in various dynamics that we look at are actually residing, they are close to this Fermi level. So, uh, <clears throat> now, if you look at critically the band structure, let's look at around gamma point, which is the origin of the Brillouin. Okay, 
So if you expand this part, you can see that there are three bands that crosses the Fermi level, this zero line. And now, if you want to form the Fermi surface, which is a closed contour around this gamma point, you can see that within this closed contour, all the K points which are there, they are unoccupied. Okay. So that means that within this closed contour or this pocket that you are getting, all the K points, they are actually hole type. That's the reason these are called hole pockets. And you have three type of these lines that's crossing. So you get three hole pockets. We can name them alpha, beta, gamma. Okay. So around gamma, you have these two hole pockets. Similarly, around X point, you can see the band actually moves like this. So if you make a closed contour here, all the K points, they are actually occupied. So they are electron-like. So you can call them electron pocket. So you have two electron pocket here and three hole pocket here. That actually forms the Fermi surface in this network. So all the behavior that we observe, they are linked to the behavior or properties of these materials. Now, if you look at very carefully, if we go along the Z axis, gamma Z, all the bands are very flat. So as if there is no Z dependence or KZ dependence of these bands. So that's the reason the band structure is more like a cylindrical. And you see, this is the effective two-dimensional electronic structure. So most of these materials which are layered, so there you get this kind of behavior. Now, what is pneumaticity that we talk about? So if you go to lower temperature, what happens is that this A and B, this crystal uh, axis, they become dissimilar. So you go from tetragonal to orthorhombic structure. And then if you look at the band structure, you can see that some of the bands that disperse and become somewhat different. So this is gamma Y and this is gamma X. And you can see that this blue one, which is D, um, I think YZ, so that has much smaller dispersion compared to the green one. So, and this difference is about 43 milli electron volt. I'm sorry, I think you may not be able to see the numbers clearly, but <clears throat> anyway. So there is a small change in dispersion because of this dissimilar lattice constant. You can also see in the red line, because the red one is more dispersing here, it goes up to this much, but here it's not going up to that. So there is a small change in dispersion because the hybridization is somewhat different. That's actually we define as pneumaticity. The other thing which happens is the antiferromagnetic order. So if you look at the Fermi surface, you have three hole pockets here and two electron pockets here. And one of the hole pocket actually is nested. Nested means that the Fermi surface looks pretty similar like the other one. And that gives rise to antiferromagnetic ordering. Okay. So which one actually gives rise to this antiferromagnetic ordering that you can do it by experiment. So if you look at RPS, so here I have shown the RPS data at uh, the antiferromagnetic phase, you can see the middle band that opens up a gap. So normally what happens is that if you have a Fermi pocket here and a, another Fermi pocket here, if there is a nesting, then this nesting vector means that uh, in the STW phase, these two becomes equivalent and you see an opening of a gap, uh, which is called the SDW gap, and that opens up in the beta band. So we can identify that there is a band called beta band that gives rise to antiferromagnetic ordering, and the other two Fermi surfaces actually survive even within the antiferromagnetic phase. So after this discussion, so what we learn from this is that, <clears throat> of course, unconventional superconductors are much more complex, you have big gap with anisotropy, which is unusual compared to the conventional ones. You have pseudo gap, strange metallic phase or Fermi liquid and so on. But the most important thing which uh, is seen in these materials where you have this coexisting kind of scenario is that the number of bands crossing the Fermi level is large. So many bands actually contribute at the Fermi level. So the question one can ask is that which electrons are responsible for which property? I mean, is it that there is a selection of electrons derive one kind of property and they are mutually exclusive or you have all the electrons they really take part in every aspect of the material property. So that's basically the question that one could ask. Now, you know that there have been a lot of discussions about this separation of magnetic ordering to get superconductivity. There is of course this electron, electron Coulomb repulsion, which is important. So this magnetism gives you spin fluctuation the Coulomb repulsion gives you charge fluctuation. Of course, there is new pneumatic fluctuation and so on. 
So what are the role that these guys are playing? Okay, Is it that they are linked? So these are basically the questions, set of questions that I wanted to ask here. And uh, let's see what we can do. Now, as we know that whenever we try to measure a magnetic property or whenever we are trying to measure the transport property, what we do, we are basically perturbing the system means you apply electric field to measure a transport property resistivity like that. If you want to measure magnetic properties, then you apply a magnetic field and so on. Basically, you are essentially driving the system from the ground state. So, so some kind of a perturbation is there and that involves interaction of the electrons to various degrees of freedom. So you can have electron phonon coupling, you can have electron electron interactions, and then of course, spin charge, orbital and pneumatic fluctuations. So there are many things which are happening. So the question is that in this part of state, how to really determine which one is playing what kind of role, or is there a way to distinguish or selectively study the properties of this electron? So that's basically the topic that I'm going to address in next few minutes. <clears throat> so basically what you do is that you part of the system, get to the excited state and see how they evolve. Okay, so that probably tells us some signature or sign of how or what they are really contributing to. So before I go into that, I just give a brief introduction which on photoemission spectroscopy, which is basically the technique that I've used. You all know, or many of you know about it. So you know that photoelectron spectroscopy is basically uh, based on the photoelectric effect where you sign light on a material and if the energy of the light is strong enough to knock out electrons from the material, so it comes out, which is called the photoelectric effect. And then you put a detector here to detect those electrons which are coming out. Okay? So you basically find out the properties of these electrons which are coming out of this material using various detection system and then utilize various conservation rules which are associated to this photo emission process because it's a quantum mechanical process and then try to map the properties of the material which is left behind by this photoelectron. So that's basically the idea, okay? So uh, <clears throat> what happens is that whenever an electron absorbs this photon, its energy of course will be get elevated by the photon energy. So if it is H nu, then this, all these energy levels uh, where the electrons are there. So these electrons will increase its energy to this much value. It will shift by H nu. Now, if the EV is the vacuum level, then electrons, which has energy higher than this level, will be able to come out. And that's the kinetic energy of these electrons. Okay? So <clears throat> the intensity of these electrons, of course, depends on many factors. One is that you are having a transition of an electron from one state to the other. So this, this transition probability is an important factor, which is this sigma e, which I'll be talking today mostly. Okay. <clears throat> the other factors are, of course, this instrumental resolution, because any system that you use for your experiment, it has certain amount of ability to detect the energy and angle and so on with certain accuracy, which is called the resolution function. So that can behave like a Gaussian and then there are lifetime uh, involved, like whenever you create a hole here, now this quantum mechanical process will be applicable as long as the hole survives. The moment the hole gets destroyed by some other electron uh, jumping back to this level, so this process no longer is valid. So that's the reason you get a broadening of your life, depending on the lifetime of this hole, as well as the electrons that you are detecting. This transition is an extremely fast process. It happens at of the order of an attosecond time. I think nowadays this attosecond laser has been, I think, uh, operational at some places, and people have found out that this uh, how the transition time uh, happens. And it has been shown that actually for S and P orbitals, uh, this uh, comes out to be some attosecond and so on. So since these electrons are coming out very very fast, so the image of the electronic structure that you capture by your photoemission process is essentially kind of a snapshot because the system or your sample doesn't have enough time 
to relax back because you know that electron phonon kind of processes happens much much slower and various other interactions which happens that's much much slower so the system doesn't have really time enough time to uh, reflect back so you get a snapshot okay so that helps us to get a local picture so basically you get a local spectral function by the photoemission process it's sensitive to the orbital character because of the uh, this transition matrix element and of course the electrons that comes out that has a certain penetration depth or escape depth so that gives you surface sensitivity of it so these are basically the thing so if you have a n particle system you part up by this uh, h nu and you have one electron that comes out leaving this n minus 1 particle system behind so the properties of this electron that you detect gives you the properties of this n minus 1 particle system okay so that's basically the technique and of course um, uh, you can write down the intensity like this so where this sigma is a initial state and final state this is the dipole matrix element okay and this is the dirac delta function and you get all these conservation rules the energy conservation momentum conservation spin and symmetry so what you can see that all the parameters that determines the electronic structure that can be actually found out experimentally by using electron spectroscopy so that's the strength of this technique i'm not go talk to, going to talk more on this so the r pace is basically in addition to the energy you also detect at which angle the electrons are coming out so that tells you the momentum information about the momentum and you can actually find out this parallel and perpendicular momentum using various relations okay so in this method so in this r pace space you can actually add another degrees of freedom which has been nowadays are one of the most i think becoming more and more popular and i think probably it would be one of the most important tool to study the electronic properties of materials so here this is the setup that we used for our data that i am going to present today so you have a titanium sapphire laser <clears throat> which gives you 1.5 electron volt beam at this kind of 50 fem fem 50 40 actually we can get a 40 to 50 fem per second uh, time scale and um, uh, the frequency is 5 kilohertz so you have a beam splitter so from here 15 to 20% of the beam gets reflected and you get a delay line or delay space and then it's actually focused onto the sample and the major part of the beam which is about 80 to 85% goes through a higher harmonic generation gas cell and then you you generate higher energies so which can be from 20 electron volt to 80 electron volt or so and that goes through a monochromator and then this photon is used as a probe so basically the the idea is that you have a photon beam of 1.5 electron volt which is called the pump beam is essentially used to excite the electronic states in this material and then the probe comes at a certain time later than the pump beam and see what is the electronic structure at that moment as i said that since the electronic transition is a very very fast process you essentially get a snapshot of the electronic structure at that moment uh, which is much much faster compared to the time scale that we use which is about 40 to 50 fm per second in our studies okay so for this we have used this r3000 analyzer and uh, so like that so this is the setup now so how, how do we set up the experiment let's look at the photoemission cross section again uh, please uh, ask me if there are any issues are there in my explanation so here let's look at this matrix element okay so how we use the selection rule so this matrix element can be expressed as psi f a dot p psi i this is the initial state wave function this is the final state and that's the dipole operator which can be written like this so if our experimental setup is like this so this is our sample this one is x axis this is the y axis so the xy plane is the sample surface and the z axis on which we put the detector so this x z plane is the photo emission plane okay so the light actually goes on this plane and the electron comes out and you detect here okay so since you are detecting electron on the detector which is lying on the z axis so if x z plane is a mirror plane or mirror symmetry plane so then this electron or psi f is a even function with respect to reflection along 
with respect to this exact plane. Okay. So psi f is even. So if psi f is even, this integral will be finite only if a dot p psi i is even. Okay. Now you can look at that. This d y z and d x y. So with respect to x reflection on x z plane, these are odd functions. So you basically need a odd function which represents a dot p to get a finite intensity. Okay. So a dot p can be odd function if your polarization of the light is along the y axis, which we call s polarization because the polarization is essentially in surface or in plane. Okay. So that way we define as s polarization. So s polarization means that a dot p is odd. So psi i must be odd. So that means that if you use s polarized light or out of plane polarization light, you basically probe only these two states. Okay. So that gives you non-zero state. If you are using pxz, of course, that will not give you any intensity. So this is the symmetry selection rule that we use. Now, similarly for the dxz state, what you need to do, you need to have a polarization which is lying in the xz plane. So if you, so then you can see that since the photon beam makes an angle with respect to the detector, a detector has a size and so on. So you can see that always the photon beam comes with an angle, so which is basically aligned along some one of the lobes and so on. So the polarization will be aligned along one of these lobes. So that gives you a large intensity for the DXZ. And since the polarization is in the XZ plane, so here what will happen is that A dot P is even, so you need an even function to get a in, in finite intensity. So this oh, is the kind five, of symmetry your selection five rule. Your five minutes. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. So this is the symmetry selection rule which is used for uh, most of the studies like where people wanted to have the gap symmetry and so on. So here, what we do is that we use this polarization symmetry selection rule for the probe pulse and look at the signal. So this, you can see these oscillations are basically comes because of the lattice vibration, because you know that if two atoms are vibrating, hybridization actually changes that shifts the Fermi level. Okay, that gives you uh, the change in intensity modulation. So if I detect the intensity between, say, for example, in this anode part, so here the integral intensity between 0.1 to 0.2 electron volt above the Fermi level. So that gives you this kind of modulation. I don't really worry about modulation now. So if you look at the train by which the, uh, the curve decays, you see that for both the polarization actually gives you the same kind of decay or relaxation. So the question is that, then you can ask, is it that the electrons, they are behaving similarly or really the technique is not good enough to detect them? So we try to propose a different kind of method. So let's look at the integral again. So this integral is essentially psi f star a dot p psi i. Now, for example, we don't know psi f. Even then, this one will be non-zero only if, if a dot p psi i is not zero. Okay. So if a dot p psi i is zero, then of course you cannot really get a intensity for this, which is used effectively for dichroism kind of things. So basically what we are trying to do is that now you use a polarized beam where the polarization vector, that is A vector, is aligned along one of the loops. So if it is aligned, you get a excitation. If it is not aligned, you don't get excitation. That's the basically idea. So uh, now if you have a A vector along Y axis, which is L polar S polarization, you don't get DXZ signal. And uh, so basically S polarization gives you this signal. And if you have a P polarization where A is lying in the XZ plane, so then you get DZX very, very intense because they are aligning along this. But as I said that the incidence angle is not really in any of these axes. Of course, you can use a grazing incidence, that's a different thing, but most of the time it makes an angle. So you do get some intensity because you do DX, Y and YZ. And uh, now if we look at the spectrum, so uh, I think this one is a recapitulation. Uh, Let's look at the result. So here, what we have done, we have used a polarized pump pulse for this kind of experiment and see the signal, how they decay. And we do see that they are actually different. See that S polarization is this dashed line and it seems to be long lived compared to the P polarized light. So even if we don't know much about Psi-F, we can see 
that we can actually get information about the symmetry of the electrons of this material, what it gains us. You look at, so here I'm showing you, this is on europium iron to arsenic. Too. You can see that if you use p-polarized light, the decay line looks like this at different temperatures. So this is 30 Kelvin to 110 Kelvin. And if you use s polarize their light, you can see they're almost flat. They're not really decaying much. And if I plot the decay time, you can see that the uh, this relaxation time for p-polarized light is much, much smaller, about 200 femtosecond, whereas the s polarized light give you uh, like, um, say, two picosecond or so, 2000 femtosecond. This is very, very unusual because you know that um, this DXZ and DYZ orbitals, if you look at very carefully in these materials, so this is your iron layer and these are the arsenic layers. So all these electron dynamics that happens because of the hybridization of the iron D orbitals with the arsenic orbitals. So these DXZ and YZ orbitals are much more uh, that way itinerant or extended compared to DXY orbitals. Now we know that this alpha gamma band, which is outside, that's actually constituted by DXY orbitals and they are much more localized, the local character it has, and DXZ and YZ orbitals, they are much more itinerant, so they are much more dispersive. That you can see very clearly, this alpha beta band, the dispersion is almost C1.5 electron volt or so, whereas the gamma band is much smaller, about 0.5 or so. So, so what we see is that if you have a local electron, their lifetime is much larger compared to the itinerant electron. This is very, very opposite to what we intuitively expect because often we talk about localization because of electron-electron scattering. And if the electron-electron electron scattering is much more, they have much more scope to lose energy or dissipate energy. And so they'll relax back faster. But here it's becoming opposite. The reason is that the uh, relaxation time that we are measuring here is of the order of say 100 femtosecond, where this electron-electron interaction terms already actually have died down. So we are looking at electron-phonon interactions. So if you have electron-phonon interactions, then the uh, itinerant electrons, they are of course more exposed to the lattice. So they have much more scope to dissipate energy compared to uh, uh, localized electrons, and that's the reason we do get this kind of difference behavior. So without showing this, I just want to show that a lot of people have been talking about orbital selective motness. Means that if you have different orbitals, which has a different kind of hybridization, their widths are different. So the effective mot properties or correlation induced effect will be different for different orbitals. So this is one of the experimental demonstration of some such orbital selective behavior that you see that local electrons behave differently from the itinerant electrons. So since there is no time, I quickly go to the last, which is another interesting point that we uh, feel that we have discovered in this experiment. Now look at this calcium iron to arsenic to data closely, close to the um, uh, excitation time where probe, pump probe time delay is close to zero. So if you're looking at 200 Kelvin, the oscillation looks like this for P and S polarized light. But if you are at 1750 Kelvin, which is below the SDW transition temperature, so you can see that S polarized light actually uh, doesn't show this lobe, but P polarized light actually can probe this. Okay, This is very, very unusual. Now, if you look at the electronic structure carefully, you know that the SDW phase means that the beta band actually opens up a gap and you have this band structure. This is because of the band folding happening because of the um, this army surface nesting that you see and a gap opens up. <laughs> if I look at the spectral function at a 50 femtosecond, which we have seen here, so this peak is at 50 femtosecond. So if you look at the spectral function at 50 femtosecond, you can see that for H polarized case, so 200 Kelvin data is the symbols and the line is 30 Kelvin data. And you can see that this gap that we are talking about actually survives. So if you shift this blue line, it uh, by about 35 milli electron volt, it overlaps with uh, black dots. So it means that you are not really influencing the SDW gap if you are using a polarized light. 
But if you use pre-polarized light, you can see that the this line is this gap is no longer surviving. You can see that the Fermi level is essentially same in both the cases, and you do have some intensity. So this shows that by pre-polarized light, you are able to destroy the magnetic order or heat the cis magnetic electrons, which is not possible by the S polarized light. This is very, very unusual. And one of the interesting thing is that if you are heating selectively these magnetic electrons by the P polarized light um, uh, and the S polarized is not able to do so, it looks like that the interactions or excitations which are happening due to the expolarized light, they are probably different or mutually exclusive compared to, to those electrons which are taking part in magnetic order. So this throws up a open question that probably that um, the magnetic ordering, what is happening by the electrons or energy bands, they may not be taking part in the properties which are dictated by other bands. Okay? So this is more like uh, the band selective or symmetry selective kind of behavior that you're observing. So this multiple kind of mutually exclusive scenario that you see, what we understand is that this kind of behavior can be probed effectively by using this kind of pump probe method where you can do symmetry selection by polarized pump pulse. You can see this behavior is, we have done several experiments at uh, using different probe energy like 20 electron volt, 29 electron volt and so on. And we often, we see that in the um, uh, paramagnetic phase, they are almost identical. But if you go to this magnetically ordered phase, so these are the whole density. You can see that for depolarized light, the depletion is much, much more compared to the S polarized light at a 50 femtosecond kind of time delay. And you see a peak here. So the intensity is, so these are both, both you can say this uh, complementary to each other. So these two observations. So, um, so from this, we think that maybe this magnetism and pneumaticity that we are observing, they may not be linked. Now this one, of course, one could uh, link this kind of observation to the bulk properties that I have shown you earlier. You can see that often many systems where the magnetic ordering temperature and the structural ordering temperature, they may not be coming together. And you can actually separate them out significantly by applying pressure or various other dopings and so on. So this shows that this kind of selectivity that you're talking about is actually real. So um, you can determine uh, effective temperature, electron effective electron temperature by using effective this family like distribution function. And uh, we see that at in the paramagnetic phase for both the polarization, they are somewhat similar. And at 150 Kelvin, you see a peak in the p-polarized case compared to so um, compared to the s-polarized case. So you essentially have a orbital selective heating. So you are uh, heating a subset of electrons by using a polarized light, which is not possible by any other method. Before I say thank you, I would like to thank all my group members. So these are the people who actually have. Uh, contributed significantly in building up the facility that we have at EIFR and at various other stages that we go to use uh, uh, facilities abroad. So these are the graduate students. So they are employed somewhere or doing postdocs. So these are the postdocs and uh, these are the ones who completed PhD in my group. And uh, these are the junior research fellows. And this is the present group. Of course, some of them have moved to this one. He has moved to US now for another postdoc who is completing his PhD. So all these bright kind of, they're extremely bright people around. So because of that, it has become possible for uh, building such an activity here, which is otherwise a very difficult thing. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, so basically I just close down with these two things. One is this uh, orbital selective behavior help to really see this uh, orbital selective relaxation time, which uh, essentially kind of experimental demonstration of orbital selective monotonous we will talk about, and also selective heating of electrons, uh, which can help to separate out uh, heating of magnetic electrons compared to other electrons that is there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Carlo, for bringing out the role of orbital selection in uh, these properties using electron spectroscopy. Now the talk is open for discussion.
either they can i don't know whether they have raised the hands or they have to you write the message here i mean one by one so talk is over for discussion any questions one new message okay there is a message here have you taken into account the different absorption frequencies of s and p polarized light have you done an explicit pump frequency depend dependence to see uh well can you can you see this question here if there are any actually uh, i'm just trying to chat at the chat have you taken into account the different absorption i'll, I'll uh, answer it then i can probably see the chat okay okay i can share okay have you taken into account the different absorption flow yes we have taken into account actually we have done a detailed study so the fluence that we uh, used is uh, about 2 uh, millijoule so which is much lower than uh, the kind of non linearity that it can introduce we have tested up to 5 millijoule okay uh, power and we have seen that there is absolutely no effect on the fluence this has been explicitly uh, checked for both the polarizations and then we have uh, looked at the data any other question i mean i can't see any other hand here so any other question okay it appears there is no other question uh, Uh, then i would like to thank all of again for giving a nice presentation bring down the role of okay, there selection. is another question oh where is that oh, okay, there is another said. question can i take yeah it? yeah yeah should please take it yeah can you read it is there also a chemical sensitivity is there on also a chemical yeah. sensitivity in addition to symmetry okay so here um, um, i don't think that because that's the thing so we have used uh, uh, much lower intensity so the fluence is we have kept it so low that the chemical sensitivity is actually negligible that's the thing which we have tested because normally this intense light can actually introduce uh, some chemical changes or any other things so this is one of the known fact so that's the reason we have kept the fluence much much lower the intensity is so low that uh, there is no change in the electronic structure this we have actually checked it because um you can use the pump light or probe light and do static rps and compare it with the synchrotron rps okay so that's basically the simple test that you can do and we have seen that the band structure looks identical so there is absolutely no change in band structure if you uh, do this independent rps measurement uh, with the pump or probe rps so the chemical sensitivity is not there thank you any other question i don't see any other question here okay thanks a lot thanks for a lot. your yeah. presentation may I hand over to pascal in case pascal would like to make some remarks at the end or or we can close the session yes well well thank you very much sampad for helping me co-chair this sections and thank you very much professor kala for the wonderful talk but before we finish so i would like to Thanks. ask our kind audience to start our videos so i can take a very nice picture so thank you all thank you very so much thank you very nice seeing you all take care and i hope to see you next time yes bye -bye. thank you thanks a lot thanks, thanks, thanks a lot thanks yeah there you go okay thank you. take care okay bye